morning if you are in the west coast of the United States. Good afternoon if you are in the east coast and good evening if you are joining us from across the ocean uh, in Europe or uh, Turkey or uh, adjoining lands of, uh, well, the former Ottoman Empire. After all, this is the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association. Uh, my name is Baki, Baki Tezjan. I teach history at the University of California in Davis, and I convene the um, online meetings of uh, OTSA uh, until the end of this year. So today, uh, as you all know, we are here together to uh, talk about what happened in Turkey most recently. Um, and I'm going to do my screen sharing with you just a second. So that um, we, we can all be on the same page. Give me one second. Here we go. You're here uh, for our Turkey Now session from the earthquakes to the disaster, uh, understanding February 6 in context. We'll start with Caroline Finkel, a historian of the Ottoman Empire and uh, the uh, co-author of, among other things, a book on the seismicity of Turkey in the Middle Ottoman period, 1500 to 1800, along with many articles in scientific journals. Her seven minutes will be devoted to a history of the earthquakes uh, once we start going. Uh, our second speaker, Bülent Batuman, uh, teaches architecture at Bilkent University. He was in the earthquake zone soon after the quakes and is well informed about all the troubles with the buildings, codes, their enforcement, and uh, what have you that uh, amplified the impact of the earthquakes and uh, contributed to it turning to a much larger disaster than uh, perhaps it could have been. Ayfer Karakaya, uh, she teaches Ottoman history at William and Mary. She was in touch with several people in different parts of the earthquake zone in the immediate aftermath of the earthquake and tried to coordinate help. She will share her reflections on the lack of early response uh, teams and the lack of coordination in the response when it arrived, as well as the delays in reaching many areas. Yusuf Atay is a Turkish American community volunteer who lives in the US but went to Turkey once he heard of the earthquakes in order to help his family. He will share his firsthand experiences on the ground. Metin Atmaca teaches at Ankara Sosyal Bilimler Üniversitesi. He has family who were directly affected by the earthquake and is well informed about Syrians in Turkey as well as in Syria. Thus, his presentation will focus on Syrians on both sides of the border. Fahri Dikkaya teaches at TED University in Ankara. He has uh, his presentation will focus on the impact of the earthquake on uh, the cultural heritage, such as archaeological sites and manuscript libraries. Ushin Önal uh, is a co-op member at the Research Institute on Turkey, which runs solidarity campaigns to support the recovery efforts in Turkey, in addition to its regular programming. She will talk about their work at RIT and how this uh, unique example became a crucial hub for solidarity uh, efforts in the US. Uh, Jihan Tual teaches at the University of California in Berkeley. He will provide us with a big picture analysis and situate the human made aspects of the disaster within the context of the political economy of creative destruction going back all the way to the Özal era and highlighting the role of the World Bank decisions in opening the path that led us all here. Um, finally, if we are lucky, uh, Garo Paylan, a member of parliament for Diyarbakir, will join us as a guest after he comes out of the group meeting of People's Democratic Party, abbreviated as HDP in Turkish. Depending on the length of their group, uh, meeting, which, as if you are following the news in Turkey today, might take much longer um, today. He might not be able to join us, or his arrival might be in the middle of the Q&A. Um, in case uh, we don't get to see him, I, I'd like to... Uh... Oh. Thank you. 
You don't hear the video though. The next one, let's go to. I don't know whether or not you could uh, see the video that I shared, but I'm going to share the link later on the uh, chat. Uh, this is a video of his talk in 2018, right before the uh, sort of amnesty on faulty buildings passed uh, the parliament where he was trying to resist uh, that passage. That's why I uh, tried to reach out to him uh, to invite him to speak to us today, because he was one of the parliament members who were really uh, keen on trying to stop that passage. Now, in terms of uh, supporting the earthquake, if you are interested in making donations or making a second donation or a third donation or continuing donations, OTSA has a web page where you can see a number of institutions listed that you could donate. Um, so please consider that. And um, if you are interested in OTSA activities, we have something coming up at the end of this month. Now I will stop uh, talking and pass the button to uh, Caroline. And I'm also gonna share my screen to uh, have her PowerPoint presentation. Caroline, please go ahead. Thanks, Berkey. Um, If you can give me a five minute warning or a two minutes at the end, that'll be good. Um, there we are. Okay, oh, you, we don't need the stuff at the side if you could get rid of that full screen. Thank you. So I just want to say, first of all, of course, how much with all of you, uh, you know, we share as best we can the grief and trauma of the people in the southeast of Turkey and Syria uh, in this terrible event and send our condolences. It's not much um, comfort to them, but uh, we do the best we can to try and help them in this aftermath. So for some years, I was employed working with an engineering seismologist, uh, largely on Ottoman earthquakes, but on, all sorts, on Ottoman archives, but on all sorts of other sources as well, working on the seismicity of Turkey and the areas around. I mean, that meant the Balkans, it meant Syria, a much wider area than is in this book, which is also, as you can see, published in Turkish by Tubitak. Next one, please. Next, yeah, there, there's a sort of picture of the well-known picture. You know how the faults work. Look at the arrows in particular. You can see the Arabian plate moving up, the African plate, all squeezing into the um, this East Anatolian fault zone here. So in a way, there should not be a much surprise at what happened um, on the 6th of February. If we look a little closer, you see here the North Anatolian Fault comes and meets the East Anatolian Fault. If I could have the next one, which is a close up there, you see the faults meet like that. This is the zone. There we are. There's Malatya and Antakya down here. Other places aren't mentioned because they weren't relevant to this particular exercise. But you can see the crunching of the land in that fault zone. Next one, please. So during the 20th century, there were very few earthquakes in that zone, big earthquakes. There would have been little tremors, but they were of much less significance. This table, for instance, shows about 20 big earthquakes in the area. And you'll see that there were only three at the bottom here, listed at the bottom in the 20th century. Uh, so it's what we call temporary um, seismic quiescence. It was atypical of the longer term um, picture in the area. If you just looked in the 20th century earthquakes, you might think there really hadn't been any, any big earthquakes, but of course the truth is somewhat other. Next, please. Here, for instance, are the 20th century ones. I'm sorry that the reds got very small. I couldn't make it much bigger. There's the Lijay earthquake in, um, in, and the, in Malatya in 1905, I think, Lijay 1975, 1971. Bin girl. So these were big earthquakes uh, about which we know, but that's about all there was during the 20th century in that zone. Next, please. These are the earthquakes from that list, the large earthquakes in that zone. And you can see the arc, how they it follows the fault from Antakya up and round through Van and on. This is an area which it is known that it has seismicity if you know where to look, but people forget. And it was not realized by people unless they were actually involved in this sort of um, work. Next one, please. This is from Big Earthquake, 1822. 
and you can see these are the dis these the intensities the intensities of damage and of the earth movement of damage in the area which to my untrained eye and i certainly don't claim in any way to be um to to to, to know how the scientific side of it works looks rather similar to the um the situation in the recent earthquake uh, there's Marash up there, there's Antep, Iskenderun, Antakya, all within the most heavily affected area of seven and eight intensity. So this, er this area was quiescent in the same, it's, it's true of Istanbul. We also wrote an, earth, uh, an article about um, seismic quiescence in Istanbul in the 20th century. There were very few large earthquakes there until we were so shocked by the one in 1999, which I'm sure many of us experienced. Um, so, you know, we have to be alert to what was happening before, what was happening in earlier historical times. Next one. Now, this is a list. If we look, for instance, at Antakya, which has been mentioned a lot in general because there was such damage there. Um, this is the beginning of a list done by Syrian colleagues. Historical earthquakes, large earthquakes, starting in BC, I think there are about 100 large ones. Um, and Dantak, it just goes on and on. All these names come up again and again. Next one, please. Antak here again, there was in early eight, 859, 860, an intensity of eight in that area. This is known, this is material that was published um, around the turn of the century by these colleagues. Next one. And here again, we have Marash and Antak here. In, in um, 1114, a big earthquake. We have good sources, lots of damage. Next one. And this is something that um, just for people might be interested to know that one of the best so sites for following um, what's going on is the um, US, the United States Geological Survey site. The material is there, open access. They've mapped these faults, the breaks in the faults. Since the earthquake, this particular slide is from the 13th of February. So it gives you a sort of ongoing um, understanding of how things are happening at the physical level um, on the ground. That's it. Thank you. Caroline, thank you so much for keeping it uh, short, brief and uh, to the point. Uh, as everybody can see, the, the, the fact that the area was prone to earthquakes was uh, very well known. And I actually would like to have also invited a seismologist, but couldn't get a hold of someone who would be available today. I talked with a colleague at uh, University of California in Davis, and uh, he said it was indeed quite unusual that two earthquakes of this almost similar magnitude happens so quickly one after another. One usually does not see an aftershock that is almost as big as the first one. He said that is indeed unusual. But if I, when I asked him about uh, similar size earthquakes in different parts of the world, uh, he gave me examples of uh, sort of uh, fatalities and uh, if you look at the developing uh, world, you do find examples that look like Turkey. But if you look at uh, countries that actually are known to be earthquake countries like California in the US or Japan, uh, we see that uh, even larger earthquakes actually cause uh, fewer fatalities. Uh, the, he mentioned the one in Japan, for instance, that was one of the largest earthquakes that happened in early 2010s. Uh, and he said that the large number of deaths in that one mainly happened because of the tsunami that followed, not because of the buildings. So uh, that is why uh, I thought of inviting somebody who would be able to tell us uh, about what is wrong with our buildings. And I really appreciate that Bülent Bey is able to join us. Uh, Bülent Bey, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. You can see it, right? Okay, now, sorry about the fact that some of the images are in Turkish. I just, you know, had to gather uh, fast. 
Um, I just, I mean, this brief presentation, I'm just going to try to uh, emphasize that the destruction, I mean, there is this cliche, right? It's not the earthquake, but the buildings that kill people. So obviously there is some truth in this. And uh, I, I, I'm just going to try to show you how this is. I mean, the, the, the destructive effect of the earthquakes in Turkey is very much related to uh, urbanization policies in Turkey, which is not limited to AKP period. But uh, this particular earthquake actually shows us how uh, the magnitude of destruction, not the magnitude of the earthquake, but the magnitude of uh, destruction has amplified uh, within the AKP era. Now, this image shows us the uh, earthquakes uh, in the 20th century, 20th and 21st centuries. And of course, they show us a pattern. I mean, this representation, this visualization itself actually shows us two things. One, of course, is the fault lines, right? So they uh, follow the fault lines, especially this North Anatolian fault line. But the, the second thing, which is also striking here, is this uh, nodal, nodal character of these earthquakes. So what we have seen so far was these earthquakes happening somewhere, uh, destroying some particular settlement uh, enormously. And then, of course, uh, its uh, influence, its uh, destruction uh, fading away, uh, the, the uh, further uh, you got away. Uh, in this sense, this particular um, earthquake uh, shows a significantly different pattern because it has affected a large uh, area. It has uh, it shows this linear pattern at, uh, along the fault line itself, and it also corresponds to uh, a series of a, a number of settlements. Now, what we have, uh, I mean, what we should see as a breaking point in, the, in, in terms of urbanization and its relationship to earthquakes in Turkey is, of course, the uh, earthquake that was in 1999, because up until now, uh, we have been witnessing earthquakes, but mostly away from these central areas, right? So especially this eastern part of Turkey, which is underdeveloped, which obviously implies several things. On the one hand, I mean, less people die uh, because population, size of economy, et cetera, et cetera. All these aspects, in a sense, uh, led to the rather... Uh, negligence of the earthquake. But when this 1999 earthquake happened, which is so close to Istanbul, of course, it was alarming, especially for Istanbul, and then certain regulations were enforced. Now, what happened was um, a new uh, regulation for uh, earthquake uh, resistance, earthquake uh, resilience was introduced, which was fine, actually, especially on paper, it's very good. Um, and secondly, a system of building inspection was implemented. This was uh, criticized heavily by the chambers of architects and engineers because it relied on uh, private sector uh, rather than public uh, kind of uh, inspections. Uh, but curiously, what happened? Well, I should show you this too because this is, I mean, these two images actually show, show us two different modes of uh, urbanization in Turkey. The first one, it's this classical squatter settlements that were, uh, that became the, uh, the, they created the texture around the major cities, Istanbul, Ankara, Izmir, Adana, all these major cities. Uh, so these shanties built by people themselves, right? And in the 1980s, we witnessed the transformation of this pattern into the letter, the one on the right. So all these uh, squatter areas, not all of them, but most of them were transformed into uh, these four or five story uh, apartment buildings, very low quality, uh, built by small contractors. And this is what actually is alarming about Istanbul, for instance, because this building stock is going to be destroyed heavily. And so, I mean, obviously what happened was the, the, the change in the regulations on the one hand required the new buildings to be uh, resilient against earthquakes. But of course there was the problem of the existing building stock which was supposed to be transformed. So there were new taxes, uh, public known as earthquake taxes. They were called something else, obviously, technically. But uh, anyway, the, the, the interesting point, of course, is 
this idea of urban transformation, in a sense, uh, came into the public agenda. Now, the government, I mean, right after this, of course, it was the RKP coming uh, into power, but they didn't use these funds for uh, transforming, renewing the uh, earthquake-prone uh, neighborhoods. Instead, well, we recently heard from a minister that they were spent for new roads and airports and whatever infrastructure. Now, of course, the curious thing is the idea of urban renewal in Turkish Kent cell donation, urban transformation as a general thing, came into uh, the uh, legal system as well. So based on the idea of transforming the earthquake prone areas, the AKP began to uh, trigger a new wave of urbanization. This was in the city centers, it was about the renewal of the remaining squatter areas, but it was also used as uh, a tool to uh, expand the city. So even areas which didn't have any kind of urban texture were, were urbanized with the claim that this was urban transformation. Obviously there is nothing urban, so it's not a transformation, but legally it was used. Now, I think what we need to do is when we look at this map, uh, the enforcement of the new regulations took some time. So it was the year 2000 and a new law was implemented in 2001 and certain provinces were selected as the pilot uh, provinces. Now the map of, of those pilot provinces is I think very important. Now, when we look at this and then these are the gray ones are the uh, pilot uh, provinces. And these were, these, the, the, the new regulations became effective in these provinces by 2001. And they, were become, they, become, uh, they became effective across the country in 2011. So for a 10 year period, it was only these uh, provinces. Now, of course, the curious thing is, can you see my cursor? When we compare these two maps, right? So you see the red coming here, right? And then when you try to follow it, what you see is this zone itself, it's uh, unfortunately the uh, areas where the earthquake hit hardest, except for Hatay, of course. So um, he, this is Malatya, Adıyaman, Kahraman Maraş, Osmaniye, this is Kilis, uh, so this is Adana. So, well, I don't need to tell you because I have this image as well. So yes, uh, curiously, the juxtaposition, the superimposition of these two maps shows us the, the, the earthquake zone itself. But there is more to this. I mean, as I said, this is also important. Um, yeah, so it's not these provinces, but these uh, settlements themselves, the cities. So I tried to uh, point the uh, settlements with population more than 50,000, which were affected. These were the ones uh, seriously affected. And of course here, Adana is a very large uh, metropolitan area and Diyarbakir as well, but they were also affected. This tells us a lot because they shouldn't have been affected this uh, badly. Uh, it also tells us something about the quality of the building stuff there, but especially the areas, Malatya, Karamamaraş, Adıyaman, Antep uh, and Osmaniye, uh, Hatay, again, is, uh, I think it should be considered separately. Uh, they show a significant pattern of destruction. Now, the curious thing, of course, is if you remember the very first images I showed you about Gece Kondu settlements transforming, these are not th those kind of metropolitan areas. That's, I think, something important. And here, I think we need to, I'm also trying to check the time, but I can't, um, okay. Uh, I'm almost 10 minutes. Uh, I think we should we should superimpose another map here, which is also curious. Now, uh, again, sorry for the Turkish, but these are the uh, greater municipalities in Turkey. And the blue ones, the light blue ones, again, corresponding to the uh, earthquake area, especially Malatya, Karamamarış and Hatay, and we can also include Şanlıurfa. These became greater municipalities in 2012, and that became effective with the elections, local elections in 2014. So the last 10 years of these cities were actually a time period when these areas were 
transformed into uh, greater municipalities. Uh, this area was uh, an area where the uh, new regulations on building inspection became effective only in 2011. So it's very curious to look at, obviously we don't have it yet, but the destruction maps, I think that's something that we will need to superimpose on top of these four maps to see the uh, juxtapositions there. Um, I'm going to very briefly tell you about, and yes, these four maps and the fifth one should be the destruction maps. I'm going to very briefly talk about uh, a case uh, that I was told about uh, when I visited the area. So this is Malatya. And uh, what you see on the left is uh, the Google Earth image of uh, Malatya in 2023. What you see on the right is the, uh, this is a comparison of two maps of 2012 and 2018. So it shows us, the red area shows us the change in the uh, texture. So it shows us where actually buildings uh, emerged between 2012 and 2018. Now you can see how this uh, southwestern uh, fringes of the city has been expanded. So here it's this and this area, right? And if we look at the previous condition of this, what we see is this. So you see, this is the area where we see the, uh, the expansion of the city happen. The curious thing here is, I mean, we have been talking about, and we are talking about, when you're talking about Istanbul and those cities which are prone to earthquake, you're talking about these uh, low quality, uh, sometimes even uh, you know, degraded slum areas, et cetera, et cetera. Poor people are, uh, living there. The curious thing here is, and I think this shows a pattern, that's why I wanted to show you this. This is an area uh, which was open to settlement as uh, a luxurious housing and wine. So what you see is very high uh, buildings, uh, residential buildings, very expensive, the, probably the most expensive in Malatya, and this was an agricultural area. So despite the objections of the Chamber of Architects in Malatya, this area was open to settlement uh, by the municipality. And then uh, it, uh, these, these buildings were severely damaged. Some of them, not all of them were demolished, but uh, some of them were demolished and all of them are heavily uh, destroyed and they're going to be uh, torn down. Not, now, this, the curious thing of course is the, strangely self-destructive class character of this. And I think we are, and once we have more data, we're going to see a pattern of this sort, uh, where uh, the, the trust for uh, profit and uh, profiting from land rent is uh, becoming uh, so uh, irrespect or, or illogical in a sense, irrational, I should say, irrational that the people who are investing there as homeowners are creating this uh, vulnerability themselves. So I think this is something curious. And of course, we, as I said, see a pattern, especially in this region, the destruction of uh, the urbanization of agricultural lands, it's not an, only an ecological problem, but it's also uh, an increased uh, proneness to earthquakes. We see this in Maraş, the new center of Maraş, which is now totally destroyed, is also an uh, example to this because the old center, it's fine. Uh, there is no much uh, destruction there, but the new center itself. And again, I should say, I mean, this is not new, not meaning that it's the RKP period, but since the 70s, 80s, the same thing we see in Osmania as well. So this expansion, this urbanization trust, uh, it has never paid very much attention to the agricultural lands. But I think the curious thing, and again, this is something specific for this region, these mid-sized cities and small cities, they have been expanding, they have been uh, urbanizing, the urban growth has been uh, with a scale of, I'm talking about the building sizes as well, building heights, uh, which does not fit the scale of the settlements. Uh, but uh, well, of course, which uh, results in uh, much higher 
uh, scales of destruction, which I think is something we will need to look closer with, with more data. Okay, thank you. I should stop here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bülent Bey. Um, now we'll have Ayfer Karakaya. Uh, on. Ayfer, are you ready? Yes, Baki, I'm here and I'm ready. I don't have a PowerPoint presentation uh, to make. My presentation is mostly based on my uh, connections in those regions that were hard hit by the earthquake. Uh, I'm not from that region and I don't have any family members who were um, impacted by the earthquake, but uh, I happen to know a lot of people in those regions because I actually did my dissertation research there and then, you know, continued visiting uh, th those areas, including Marash, uh, Adiyaman, uh, Malatya, and, and, and Hatay. Uh, so I, 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 I know a lot of people there and I know way too many people who lost uh, several family members and their homes and so on. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the post-disaster uh, response or, or or the government's failure to respond uh, uh, in the aftermath of the earthquake. Uh, I think at this point, few people would disagree that uh, uh, Turkey's uh, or rather the Turkish government's uh, earthquake response uh, was a catastrophic failure, which costed the lives of thousands of people. Uh, thousands and thousands of people uh, died under the rubble. Uh, screaming for help or froze to death because uh, search and rescue forces of the government uh, did not act swiftly enough. Uh, there were uh, there was really literally no support or help uh, during the uh, first uh, most critical 48 hours. And in places uh, where there were uh, some uh, uh, some uh, I, I suppose uh, help, uh, there were uh, far too few rescue personnel at these at these disaster sites, um, and and this is really what compounded uh, the disaster, and and we ended up with such an uh, a high uh, death toll, which is officially stands at fifty almost fifty thousand right now, but nobody on the ground actually thinks this this reflects the real numbers. A lot most people think that uh, the, the actual numbers are higher, so. Um, why uh, why was uh, uh, the government's uh, post-disaster response uh, such a complete failure? Uh, I, I'm obviously not going to say anything about the uh, lack of pre preparedness for the disaster, even though this was a, a predicted catastrophe. Uh, and, and, you know, this has already been uh, touched upon by uh, Bülent Batuman uh, before me. Uh, what I want to focus on is, is the post-disaster response and why, why they felt so miserably. So based on what everybody says and you know, everything that I've heard from people, uh, you know, what, one of the main reasons for this uh, great failure is, is that uh, the resources of the armed forces were not mobilized, uh, at least not, uh, not mobilized to its fullest extent, even though uh, disaster response historically uh, was uh, one of the primary uh, functions of the armed forces. And, and they did, uh, for example, uh, do a, a very important job during the 1999 uh, earthquake. Um, and, and there are reasons for why, I mean, we are all probably uh, familiar with them, why, uh, why Tayyip Erdogan uh, uh, did not want to, uh, why he wanted to roll back on uh, the public visibility of the armed forces. Uh, and I'm not going to go into any of the details. So the second uh, uh, reason for this great failure was, of course, the inept uh, ineptness of AFAT, uh, Turkey's Disaster and Emergency Management Authority that was created uh, by Erdogan in 2009 to replace uh, the armed forces as the primary government institution to carry out uh, rescue and disaster, you know, search and uh, rescue uh, um, uh, efforts uh, in case of a disaster. Uh, and Afad uh, proved to be uh, totally incompetent because uh, as in many other uh, state institutions, uh, Tayyip Erdogan, 
uh, filled it with uh, his own uh, loyalists or family members or family members of other leading AKP uh, politicians without regard to uh, any of the sort of, you know, uh, uh, whether or not these individuals had the necessary credentials. Uh, and those individuals were appointed in key positions in, in most government institutions, state institutions, including AFAD. In fact, last January, we know that Tayyip Erdogan appointed this, this one guy, and I don't even know his name, but uh, he is a graduate of uh, the Faculty of Theology, uh, has not, no expertise whatsoever, no experience whatsoever with, uh, uh, with um, uh, uh, disaster response. Uh, or anything like that. And, and this is a pattern, right? I mean, uh, nowadays it seems like uh, uh, if you want to be appointed to uh, an important position, to a key position in Turkey, not only do you have to be somehow connected to the AKP government, but you should also have uh, uh, your uh, educational background should be in Islamic studies, in Islamic theology. Um, so, so far, I mean, like, these are all, uh, 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 oh, wait, so I should also say that um, in addition to uh, the absence of the armed forces and the incompetence of Afad, uh, you know, oddly, uh, the government also chose to sideline several very effective uh, civil societal organizations, NGOs, which played an important role, again, in the 1999 uh, earthquake, uh, such as Akut uh, and and or or the Red Crescent, uh, which came under uh, the influence of Erdogan as well, and and, and also local uh, like uh, governments uh, that belong to the opposition party, controlled by the opposition party, and many 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 other civil societal organizations who mobilize very rapidly, very effectively. But uh, after the second day, I believe, I believe it was on the third day that uh, uh, the government issued or declared a martial law uh, and, and, and said that all aid will have to be approved by Afat, will have to go through Afat. So that was uh, extremely detrimental to uh, the efforts of the civil society, of NGOs to uh, bring uh, uh, Aid uh, uh, to these people uh, in, in in the in the coming uh, days as well, um, and 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 uh, I mean not only so so rather than trying to coordinate these civil societal efforts, the government actually viewed these uh, NGOs as competition and as groups that uh, uh, present uh, the government or the Turkish state as weak. For example, Ahbap, because many people chose to make their donations through this uh, uh, non-governmental organization, Ahbap, who is headed by a, a, a rock star in Turkey, very trusted uh, person, they uh, the government viewed this as uh, as uh, competition and as sort of trying to uh, make the Turkish state uh, look weak. So all those things uh, basically combined. Uh, uh, produced uh, uh, the results that we have today, where we have thousands and thousands of people uh, who, who who died uh, uh, under the uh, uh, rubble and, and, and you know, for days and days uh, uh, screaming for help. Um, okay, so th those are all uh, widely known. Uh, I, I mean, in addition to sort of summarizing that, I want to make two, two, two more points, which are not as much talked about. Uh, number one, um, the impact of this devastation on agriculture and, and, and the livestock. Uh, I just want to, uh, I looked this up and uh, I found out that 20% uh, of Turkey's agricultural production and 15% of the livestock production in Turkey uh, comes from these regions. Uh, so uh, this is going to uh, this means a huge blow uh, to uh, to agriculture and, and livestock production uh, in Turkey, not to mention that thousands and thousands of uh, 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 cows and sheep and, you know, livestock, they actually also, uh, uh, they were trapped under the rubble and uh, also suffered horrible deaths. Um, and uh, one sort of big issue that is not 
covered in the media much is that uh, those who survived and who are unwilling to to leave their villages because they have uh, uh, livestock and 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 you know they have fields uh, that they need to attend to, uh, there is not enough uh, animal feed. Uh, in those places, and, and and animals are literally starving to death. So that's one thing that is uh, oftentimes ignored. The other point that I want to make, and, and this is uh, this is probably the most unfortunate of of all the things that I have so far. I've said so far. Um, uh, as, 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 as you know, uh, the regions that were hardest hit uh, by this earthquake include areas. Uh, with a, uh, uh, a places that are considered as strongholds uh, of uh, a number of ethnic and religious minorities, uh, including uh, uh, including uh, the Alevis or Alawites, Kurds, as well as uh, uh, non-Muslim uh, minorities, and. Uh, and and as it happens, uh, these minorities oftentimes are also closely sort of linked uh, to opposition parties. So political opposition combined with uh, 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 you know uh, their uh, sort of status as uh, um, quote unquote undesirable uh, minorities uh, from the perspective of the uh, sort of the official ideology, I suppose. Uh, so a lot of these people, and I've been I've been talking to many of them. Unfortunately, and I hope this is false, but many of them are under the impression that there was not only this is not only a case of a complete incompetence, but that there was also some willful negligence in uh, uh, in 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 bringing uh, support and aid to, to these regions. That there was something uh, more cynical more intentional going on here, that these people were basically left to fend for themselves. And uh, that is, like I said, uh, I hope this is simply a paranoia and, and it's not true. There's no way of proving that at this point, but I have to say that there is a very common uh, sense among these groups uh, that that uh, there was some uh, willful negligence, uh, unfortunately, in in helping out uh, some of these uh, regions. And when I ask them, you know, what is your proof for that? Did you actually go and sort of compare uh, different villages or, or neighborhoods with one another? Uh, they tell me that well, no, nobody can actually give me a, a concrete proof, obviously. But a very very common complaint is that. Um, the aid trucks uh, that were sent uh, to these regions uh, by people in, in in the diaspora or or or, or in, in other places within Turkey, uh, especially starting on the third day, uh, they were uh, blocked uh, by Afat uh, under the pretext that you know all aid has to go through Afat. But the problem is. Uh, th 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 that that aid that was sent to a particular uh, region, village, or province by people from that region uh, would be redirected to other places. So we ended up with a situation whereby uh, uh, most of the aid, it seems like, again, I cannot prove this, but that's my impression, would go to uh, city centers and to, to, to particular areas and 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 with uh, uh, especially the rural uh, regions, the villages uh, uh, being left uh, without any aid and uh, support, and all the aid and support sent specifically to those regions being redirected uh, to to uh, other uh, areas. So um, I think I will stop here. I don't know how many minutes is that. Is that? Uh, we are actually running ahead behind time. So oh, I'm quick, sorry. Quick, okay. Quick yeah, I'll, I'll stop I, here. I, I, I don't try to intervene. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. <laughs> I will just share the link to the list of charities and then also mention the name of the person uh, that I just referred to. Is my... Okay, I'm very sorry. That happened by my mistake. Uh, Ismail Palakolu is the name. Uh, Ismail Palakolu, the, yes. Uh, of the Afad uh, uh, Müdür, who's responsible for um, intervention into uh, disasters. He holds an MA degree in Sufism, and his early career was in uh, Türkiye Diyanet Vakfı. 
Uh, and then all of a sudden, after spending some years in that career, he was appointed to Afad. So imagine me as a scholar of Ottoman history, how effective would I be if I were appointed to Afad? I don't think I could do anything. So uh, there is just that. And in, just to add another thing to what I first said, I remember reading very vividly that aid sent to Samanda was uh, stopped and uh, not let to go there. And our next speaker, uh, our Turkish American uh, community volunteer, actually went to Samanda. Yusuf Bey, please go ahead. Uh, hey everyone, uh, I'd like to share my experience. Uh, actually, I'm from Samanda originally, and uh, my family lives over there. Uh, unfortunately, I lost four family members, and then uh, many other losses, uh, friends, and uh, and then neighbors over there. Uh, when I heard uh, first, I was in Texas, uh, in the United States. I originally lived in Virginia, and uh, I my flight landed, and I saw a post on Facebook that was an earthquake over there. So I tried to call my mom. I wasn't um, in uh, precious that that's gonna happen a disaster over there. I just called my mom to make sure she's safe. So I I was not able to reach her out. I called my sister. Who lives in Virginia? I say, hey, did you call mom because there is an earthquake? Should they say, um, yes, we are trying. We heard about it. We're trying to call her, but uh, we cannot reach her out. But calm down, everything is okay. So in few minutes, um, one of our friends over there went to our home, and then, thanks God, my mom was safe. The second person that I just, you know, was in my mind, in my brain, was my aunt, and then. Um, their building was not that great, but because they are financial not okay, they had to leave this building. Um, it's been like a couple of years over there that they were trying to buy another house, but they couldn't. So actually they died because financially they were not okay to buy another house. Anyway, so I say, how is my aunt? And, and then we were trying to reach her out and then we couldn't get any answer. My two aunts, my, my two cousins, and then my uncle, my aunt's husband, was in the same building. And I was thinking that it was only their building was in danger because they had the old building. I didn't know that there was disaster over there. So in two hours, unfortunately, we get the news that my cousin, 25 years old, she was not alive. She was not with us no more and then my two aunts and my uncle. One of my cousins was able to get out. She had like a minor uh, scare on, on, on her body and then another cousin, her leg was not okay. And uh, that was the news that I heard. I was like, okay, I'm going back to Turkey. So at the moment that I heard that I had all these like losses, I took flight from Texas uh, to Richmond, Virginia, then went to uh, Washington DC airport, take a flight to uh, Istanbul. You know, it takes like 12 hours. Then wait in Istanbul. And uh, we couldn't take a flight to Hatay. Um, I had to land to the Adana. I went to Adana, wait over there for five hours. Um, also, during this time, I learned that my brother, girlfriend, under the rubbles. So I was trying to reach out uh, a lot of friends, a lot of uh, Professor Dochens, uh, and, and then I was uh, one of them, and uh, try to get any help from Afad, from government, from uh, town halls, anywhere from ministries in Turkey, but we couldn't reach out anyone over there, like nobody was answering, nobody was giving us any help or any, any answer. And I thought that I was like, I could get any help because I have a lot of communications with the people and then you know a lot of people, but it didn't work over there. So I had to call a lot of friends. I say, please go to this address and then try to take out this girl from there because they don't have any help. And uh, when I was in Adana, I heard that my brother girlfriend was able to get out like, with help from, from friends. And Unfortunately, her older sister, 24 
years old died in in this earthquake as well and then her mother also was safe and then they took her sister i mean was died her, her mother was alive but she lost her uh her, her leg her, her foot actually uh she was in adana in hospital went over there saw her and then tried to give her little power and then tell her that i am with you and all those stuff but unfortunately we couldn't have we couldn't help her uh, with her food she, they had to cut her food anyway uh, during these hours i was in adana and then i took a car friend of me came from nida and then dropped me off to samandar so i was reading some news and and then i was under the pressure that there was no way to go to Samanda. That's why we cannot get any help. And then people over there, I wasn't able to like, there wasn't any internet, any electric, any other like first aid stuff. And I was under the impression that I'm not gonna be able to go over there, but I was able to go over there like in, in three or four hours. Yes, the road was bad, the road was damaged, but there was a way to go over there. Like we we didn't stop on the way. There was a, there was a way to go over there to help people, but the people over there because they are under the rubbles, and then there lost so many people in their family. They couldn't like raise their voice over there. So I was trying to share many like posts on Facebook on internet to to get help, and then make their their voice a little bit like crazy. Anyway, I went to Samanda. When I when I entered the city Hatay from Madana, I saw a lot of machine, like heavy machine uh, machines on the way, but they were not working. Maybe 50, 60 of them. Like they were on the side. I don't know who they are belong to. I don't know who owned them. I don't know where they came from. I was in shock because I lost a lot of people. But there was a lot of machines on the way, on the road, that they were not trying to even help people over there that under the rubbles. And then we had like disaster. Like you can see all the buildings, like they are like rubbles now. They, there is no, and then you can hear all these voices under the rubbles. But unfortunately, you cannot help because that's not a person that can do anything about it. Went to Samanda, my city, I, I just had my wedding. like. That was like a great wedding over there. A lot of good people, a lot of like happy people over there, a lot of happiness with with their self, no help from, from the other cities. The city was dead. Nobody was there. Nobody like, even the people who lived over there and then they were alive, they were not in the roads. I don't know what happened. It's like, there is a car that I am going with. There is another car behind me, but. The only thing that I saw, small bakery that they are selling like some bread, and then they are selling like six breads at a time, and it wasn't in Samanda. It was actually between Antakya and Samanda. So when I was going from Antakya and Samanda, I saw a lot of buildings that's not in livable condition. Went over there, I didn't see any help, any effort, any kozulai, any other like even volunteer people was not there yet. In the third day that I ever arrived over there. So when I went there, I was surprised. I went over there to help people that I can do something. I was so surprised. The rest of my family member tried to live over there with this cold. I have a cousin that was a disabled like mentally and then, and then physically. I have a lot of cousins. They were like kids. Uh, my uncles, my aunts, they forgot about their laws. They were trying to survive in two days because there was no electric, no internet, no water, nothing, no toilets, nothing over there that they're trying to survive in a small garage that my uncle had. Went over there, I forgot about my loss too. I felt that I am living in disaster right now. I don't know what to do. Like I had a mentally, I was like so okay till I arrived over there. I don't know what to do. I have like four people that we have to go and then find a grave for them. It's it's unbelievable. Like it was like longest night that I had over there. In fourth day, my uncle went over to the hospital 
to find out our losses and then take them, bring them to the home. She could, he couldn't find them. It, there was like thousands of people in a hospital. They died and we cannot get them out just to grave them. We were like very sharp, like we have to survive. And then we had to take our losses to the, <laughs> to the grave. We didn't have even like funeral for them. It was crazy. Then he called me, by the way, like you cannot use WhatsApp, any messages, like you can directly call and then you're lucky if you get a call in an hour. Like it was like so hard to get in touch with people. Anyway, I get a call from him. I was like, listen, I can't handle that. My heart, it doesn't let me do it. It's a lot of people. I cannot find them. It's, it's crazy over there. I say, okay, what to do now? Then I take, I take my another cousin, my friend to the hospital. I wasn't that strong. I thought that I was strong enough to find them, but I couldn't find them. My, my cousin went inside, my friend went inside. They spent two hours to find our losses. My aunt is, you cannot even tell it was her. My cousin, 25 years old, it, it was unbelievable. There was nothing over there from, from, from the government, from, Nothing. I mean, I can't. I can't explain that. It's it's really hard to explain it because I'm imagining right now. I'm sorry if, if I'm going too long, but uh, then we took our loss with a pickup truck that we rented out from another guy, and he came in and then took our losses to the hut. We felt so lucky because we found a grave for them. We couldn't in, find any like shroud for them at the beginning. That was like. You cannot find a shrub to just, you know, and there was no help. It was like four days that we are trying to go over there and then find the growth. We forgot about losses. Nothing. I mean, we can't feel our losses at this time. And we went over there. Unfortunately, we couldn't find any water. We, we couldn't wash our losses. Like it's, it's crazy. And, uh, and then we put them in, in the grove and then I had to decide that either we had to stay over there or we had to leave the city. And then my uncles never ever left their city for their homes. It's it's a farmer people. They don't live outside. It's, it's just living in their homes, like their small words. They don't ask for anything. They don't know how to ask for any help either. So I was like, I called my sister. I said, listen, I'm taking them to the mercy because it was the closest city to Hatay Samanda. I said, I'm, I had to take them because there is no funeral over there. Nobody can come to, there is no house. There is no water. My mom was like about to die because it was too cold. That was the second night that I stay in Samanda. I say, I mean, right now we don't think about losses. We think about the surviving. And then I feel like if I stay like third day over there, I will feel exactly the same way. So on fourth day, when I was trying to find something to take them out, um, our family member from Izmir sent us a bus. And then the bus was not able to get into the Samanda because Afat did not let them to get into the Samanda. They bring some help and then Afat like took away all this help. I don't know where it went. There wasn't any food, any aid, nothing over there. And then my cousin that who lost her sister, father, and mother over there, uh, she was in hospital, we took them home. She was not in livable con conditions. I don't know. She wasn't answering anything. I didn't know what to do with her as well. So second time, they sent another bus for, for us. The bus came from Arsul's Rod that the Afat cannot stop there. So finally, we get some help for the people uh, with this bus, on the second bus. And then I took my family out from there. But that was people on, under the rubbles that I could hear at the same time. It's like, I cannot help them. It's, I didn't know what to do. Like one of my friends that who went with me from here to there, her mom was under the rubbles and and then we could see her her hand. And then she was like really close to me that that was, she was also a family member, but nobody was helping to take her out. Like it's, it's fifth day, sixth day, nobody can do anything over there. There wasn't any help, anything. 
we left over there, people still like need like tents. Like people still need food. People still need aid. I'm not even talking about like a normal condition right now over there, but people need a lot of stuff over there. That that's all I, I want to say. There are a lot to say, but I really don't want to go into all this stuff and then take a lot of time out there. Just want to share my first experience with you guys that you guys know about all the stuff that's happening over there. Başını sağ olsun Yusuf Bey. Çok teşekkür Allah kederim sağ ol. Sabırlar versin. Sağ ol. Teşekkürler. Yani bilmiyorum insan diyecek bir şey bulamıyor söz. Ne 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 söylenebilir bilemiyorum. Çok, çok üzgünüm. Teşekkür ederim sağ ol. Metin Bey, please go ahead. Uh, thank you Bakir hocam. Ee, başın sağ olsun Yusuf Bey ee, e, Allah rahmet etsin ee, geçmişlerini kalanlara da sabır versin ee, I was there uh, for a visit in uh, Gaziantep uh, during the uh, earthquake so on the 6th uh, when it started to tremble we had uh, family members uh, in the house my mother, my uh, cousins and uh, my two aunts, uh, we, we didn't understand really what was going on. Uh, we immediately got out. Uh, when we got out, we realized that everybody was out because uh, it was a very strong trembling. I mean, I never experienced such an earthquake. I had others, but never such a thing. And it took more than one and a half minutes, probably. Uh, it was just for me, probably five minutes, that's what I felt. Uh, but anyway, without uh, much trouble, we were lucky to get out and uh, it was really cold, uh, probably one of the coldest time during the year uh, in Antep. And uh, we stayed out for several hours, probably six, seven, eight hours, but uh, without food and uh, uh, much uh, sleep. So, we didn't know what to do. Uh, as uh, uh, Bülent Bey probably was stating, or Baki Hocam was stating that uh, through one of the professors on uh, uh, geology, I mean, we thought that it was only once and it would never happen again. Such a strong earthquake probably wouldn't repeat. So a couple of us decided to get into the house to get some stuff out. And that was the second one. And from that point on, we never went back and we immediately jumped in our cars and tried to get out of the city. It wasn't easy actually to get out uh, because I was looking for some information. So as Yusuf was stating that there wasn't much information about what was going on too. So the first thing we checked Google and Google was stating that earthquake was closed by Gaziantep, but at the same time, we had no idea what was going on in the other cities or the roads. Uh, we were trying to get out of the city, but which roads to get through to Ankara and Istanbul. So the only information I was able to get was uh, through a local uh, driver, a taxi driver. I asked him which road would be the best to get out of the city. He said, don't ever go uh, towards Adana uh, through uh, Nurda and Osmaniye. Instead, I would suggest you to get through the road uh, towards Kahraman Marash, whereas uh, which was the center of the uh, first uh, earthquake. I mean, uh, uh, close by Pazar, uh, Pazarcik. Anyway, we decided to get through there. Uh, I mean, I had uh, several people in the car, my mom, uh, my aunts uh, and cousin. And when we arrived to uh, Paraman Marash, close by 6 or 7 p.m., we realized that there were several cracks uh, on the road, but somehow they were felt. I don't know who was uh, who had this benevolent attitude, but uh, we had we have seen no one, police or gendarmerie or someone else. So we were able to pass through these roads, but uh, when we arrived to Karaman Marsh, it was totally a darkness, a total darkness. The only sounds we had was sirens uh, of the ambulances. When we passed through there. Uh, uh, continuing to towards uh, Kayseri, there was a 
I mean, a, a huge uh, uh, snow uh, on the way. Uh, it, uh, it was a blizzard, definitely a, a strong one. Uh, not hundreds, but thousands of cars stuck on the road because they couldn't find much gas. Uh, we were lucky to have some extra gas uh, to drive at least three, 200, uh, uh, 400 kilometers. So we didn't stop, uh, but it took us more than 30 hours to pass uh, Ankara and uh, arrive to Istanbul. Uh, it was uh, definitely a long night. While we drew, drew I mean, uh, I had family members in my mind. My Brother was in Gaziantep, but uh, we were all safe. My sister lived in close by uh, Iskenderun. Uh, she was safe too. But the only that we had another uh, family members through my uh, wife, uh, but we never remembered her uh, till we reached uh, uh, Istanbul and asked my wife uh, about her. She said she hasn't received any news for the last two or uh, at least two days. So the third day uh, when we reached her, she lives in uh, Antakya. Uh, she said she was able to jump out of uh, the house with four kids, uh, but she was uh, um, she had several uh, broken uh, 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 pieces or her 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 leg and her uh, spinal cord uh, uh, was hurt. So, uh, but some people helped her to get in a, into a bus, uh, a minibus, and she stayed there for at least two days without food or phone or clothes or anything. Uh, so we were lucky, I mean, uh, for, for her, but the reason we couldn't remember her, uh, all the family members, uh, wasn't only us, uh, but it was actually almost the whole Turkey forgot about uh, Syrian people. She came from Banyas, uh, Tartus, uh, in two, 2011, when she lost her house there, uh, when some of the first massacres took place uh, back then uh, by the state-sponsored uh, militias. And that was her second house, and she lost it again. So uh, uh, I wanted to highlight a little bit about uh, the Syrians uh, in Turkey um, who were uh, affected by the earthquake. Uh, and uh, how much politics actually played uh, into their situation too. At least half of the Syrians actually live uh, uh, in that area. 3.5 million Syrians, uh, we assume that uh, are in Turkey, uh, 460,000 in Gaziantep, 350,000 in Antakya, and uh, the rest in uh, Adana, Şanlıurfa, and uh, other places uh, located. And uh, during the earthquake, uh, probably they were influenced, affected more uh, compared to the uh, citizens and uh, other uh, people because their housing situation was already in despair uh, for a long time. Uh, they lived in uh, uh, poorer areas uh, of the cities uh, and they, many of them didn't have proper housing too. Uh, but according to some statistic, uh, at least 4,300 of them passed away in Turkey uh, and unknown number of disappearances as well. Um, uh, probably the numbers are higher because, uh, as I said, most of them are not citizens, so they are not very well counted. And many of them carried back their bodies to uh, northwest part of Syria, at least 1,800 of them, we know it. And more close to 50,000 of them actually decided to move back to Syria instead of staying because of several reasons. I mean, one of the reasons was uh, definitely uh, not being able to get uh, enough services uh, through uh, aid agencies. Uh, they were, in many cases, I uh heard from first accounts that they were discriminated for example a family stated that they stayed in uh, Gaziantep in one of the stadiums for three days but got no food and they finally decided to move to Ankara 
Uh, and I asked several uh, aid agencies if they could be relocated in one of these housing uh, facilities or places that uh, the rest of community stays. Basically, they were unwilling uh, to do it because they stated that if we put them together with the rest of the population, they might be uh, hurt because the population is uh, react reactive to uh, the Syrians. So uh, uh, politics has been for a while playing with actually the uh, uh, problem of the Syrian refugees in Turkey from both sides, both the uh, government as well as the uh, uh, opposition parties. Majority of parties actually have been uh, abusing the problem uh, uh, in, in their politics. Uh, I mean, you have, I'm sure you heard of uh, the mayor of Bolo has been forcing them out by increasing the uh, uh, water bills 10 times more, or uh, in some of the cities, they have been actually by population themselves, I mean, uh, been uh, uh, extradited or um, uh, excluded. So uh, um, politics has played, has been playing a lot actually um, in their situation and people have been receiving and perceiving uh, easily actually what uh, has been produced by politics towards the Syrians. Um, I mean, uh, in uh, Gaziantep, for example, in the second day, there was a group of people gathered and uh, uh, shouting uh, out uh, about the Syrians and asking them to leave uh, the country. Uh, so uh, many of them actually uh, escaped uh, uh, to the northwest of Syria because of such uh, uh, public and popular uh, uh, discrimination too. Um, on the other side of the border, the situation is much worse. Uh, I had several uh, friends who went to Antakya uh, as doctors. They stated that they had uh, many ambulances uh, um, without uh, being occupied, but never decided or never uh, uh, went to other side of the border uh, to get the um, uh, survivors from there. Uh, I had, for example, uh, a brother-in-law on the other side of the border, his family, uh, the one I was mentioning in Antakya, he couldn't get any news from them. He tried to uh, enter the country, even though he had the citizenship too. He was prevented for close to five days to enter uh, the country so he could uh, basically figure it out uh, the fate of uh, his family. Um, there has been probably, you have heard about um, uh, a newborn uh, in Syria out of uh, the rubbles uh, in Genderes. The city of Genderes probably is uh, uh, at the biggest humanitarian disasters that happened there uh, because uh, at least 250 houses collapsed uh, and uh, close to a thousand people died, according to some eyewitnesses. If there was help in the first couple of days, probably not a thousand, but the most 250 people would die. Um, on the other side of the border, as I said, there was not much, and genders is actually, has been occupied by uh, Turkey. I mean, it's uh, part of uh, the uh, rulers, at least the, um, the opposition parties that are uh, there are supported by Turkey too. Uh, and the aid uh, also has not been reaching to these peoples on the other side uh, because majority of aid has been distributed by these opposition parties and they have been uh, seizing uh, any aids that has reached there and distributing, uh, sometimes even selling uh, to uh, the families and people that they have been basically um, listing uh, by themselves. So um, uh, 
the disasters has doubled and tripled on the other side of the borders for Syrians, uh, as uh, probably you have seen uh, throughout of uh, the news. The aid agencies hasn't been; they have not been able to distribute much uh, aid there too, and they have been left to their fate. Uh, so, uh, uh, on the Turkish side too, as I have explained, it was uh, not a very uh, good picture. I mean, as uh, Yusuf was uh, explaining well, actually, I mean, no one could expect aid to other side while uh, Antakya, much of Antakya was expecting aid to be distributed to themselves. So, uh, but again, uh, we have to see the other side of it too, because many of Syrians now have been stating that uh, as you see, the borders are very artificial. Uh, the earthquake has shown that uh, Hatay is not only part of Turkey, but also it's part of Syria too. Uh, the population, the geography, and the fate. So uh, I hope uh, people here also can see that picture very well and, and do not forget about uh, what happened in Turkey. Thank you. Thank you, Metin Bey. Çok büyük geçmiş olsun. Inshallah, uh, yeah, I hope your uh, sister-in-law is in doing okay. Um, your uh, family is uh, now found some place to stay. I hope the one who uh, I know you were looking for uh, some help. I hope that worked out. And thank you so much for sharing on Syria. We, our list of charities on the website that I shared the link to includes several charities that actually support Syria. So uh, if uh, you're interested, anyone in the audience, please uh, feel free. Uh, to look at them. And now uh, our next speaker is Fahri Dikkaya, who will talk, tell us about the uh, impact of the earthquake on the um, uh, landscape in terms of uh, archaeological sites, manuscript libraries, um, so the cultural heritage. Please, Fahri, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Baki. Now I'm sharing the screen. Um, okay. Do you see my screen? Do you hear me? Okay. So as an archeologist uh, and historian, talking about the archeological sites and um, the, uh, the cultural heritage in the uh, earthquake, earthquake zone. And uh, according to Minister of Culture, almost all of the archeological sites or excavation sites have not suffered any major destruction or damage. And when we look at the uh, when, when we look at this uh, this area, uh, there are many uh, some great important uh, archaeological sites like Ektitepe, Zeyugma, Antepe, Tel Taynat, Tel Achana, Nemruta, Domustepe, and so on. And you can see many international archaeological teams like uh, univers uh, from University of Toronto, uh, University of Chicago, um, uh, Rome University, and the Turkish archaeological teams work in this region also. And um, yes, we haven't seen any major destruction or death in the archaeological site, but uh, some uh, sites have uh, minor um, uh, damages like Arslantepe in Malatya, uh, this site is very important for the world history to understand the emergence of the state and the emergence of the stratified society, especially this palace. Bronze Age palace is very important to understand the stratified society, the emergence of the stratified society in, uh, in the world history. On the other hand, we, uh, we understood the Mesopotamian expansion also, this region expansion. Here you can see some damage on the uh, mud brick walls of this uh, of this of this palace, but uh, the famous wall paintings uh, were not damaged in in this area in this uh, in this site. On the other hand, uh, part of the modern roof built uh, for protection of this palace. Here you can see in this in this picture um, this. Group were uh, collapsed also in uh, in Arslan Tepe. 
uh, there is no damage in other areas of this site. Uh, this is mostly uh, uh, in good condition. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes. Another important site um, uh, for this region is Perre. This is the ancient Adiaman, uh, the first settlement of Adiaman, uh, Adiaman City Center. Uh, we haven't seen any damage in the uh, in the uh, archaeological site, but uh, uh, the uh, the newly built uh, modern guest reception structure here you can see this structure uh, was co completely collapsed uh, in this in this period. Uh, pardon in this uh, in this earthquake. Uh, another another damage was seen in Nemrut uh, Nemrut da uh, archaeological park also. Uh, one of the column in. Um, Karakush tumulus was collapsed uh, in this in this area, and this uh, this column is very important uh, world history because um, here we saw two representation of the equality equality between gods and a human being, and this is one of the first representation of the humanistic uh, thought also in the world history, and this uh, this column collapsed, but the the relief is not damaged um, uh, badly. So um, uh, most probably this column will be restored in, uh, in, the, uh, in the later periods. Uh, note was reported for Zeyukuma and Göbekli Tepe, two important and famous archaeological sites in the region. Likewise, no earthquake damage uh, has been reported at the archaeological sites in Antakya also. Um, when we uh, in this uh, in this uh, in the earthquakes, generally we talk about the apartments and the of the apartments also. This is the first apartment of Anatolia. This is the first apartment of uh, Turkey, uh, and one of the first uh, apartment of the world history also that we know uh, from archaeological uh, uh, context. This is located in Udunja Burj, and it was built in before 1,500 years ago. And when I when I called my friend, the head of this excavation, he told me uh, this apartment is uh, still um, uh, this apartment are still standing. Uh, there is not any damage of this apartment, and uh, we haven't seen any uh, damage in this uh, in this site also. Burj, very fantastic site in Turkish, uh, in Turkish archaeology, in Anatolian archaeology. Uh, we saw the similar uh, similar story for um, um, Candere Köprüs also in Adıyaman. If you follow uh, Turkish media, you can see many news about this uh, this uh, bridge uh, after the earthquake. Uh, this bridge, uh, this bridge, uh, with all, uh, which this bridge is also undamaged, and we haven't seen any any um, uh, any problem uh, in this uh, in this bridge. Uh, on the other hand, when we look at the uh, the earthquake zone, uh, 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 there are many uh, important uh, archaeological museums. Uh, like uh, Hatay Archaeological Museum, one um, uh, this is the uh, the biggest uh, mosaic museum in the world, like uh, Zeyugma Museum, and uh, uh, Malatya um, Archaeological Museum is an important uh, archaeological museum in this in this region. And according to Minister of Culture, uh, there is no serious damage to the museums in this region. Only a small part of Antakya Museum, uh, Hatay Archaeological Museum, is damaged. The H block, uh, the roof of the H block, um, uh, was uh, it was collapsed. Um, I mean, uh, when we when we look at the Minister of Culture, um, two days after the earthquake, uh, the minister um, the, uh, the Minister of Culture uh, issued a statement on the status and protection of museums. And archaeological sites in the region. Here you see uh, this statement, and um, 
they uh, organized very quickly uh, to protect the museums and the archaeological sites. And uh, this statement, uh, this statement, the translation of this statement can be found on the British Institute website. Here you can see, and uh, you can see uh, the Turkish, um, uh, the Turkish, the original text of this uh, statement also in this in this website. So um, when when we look at uh, this statement. Uh, um, it is. It repeats what I have just said about the situation and protections of the archaeological sites like Arslan Tepe or Zeygma and the museums in this talk. And um, and here you see uh, the uh, the Turkish original uh, uh, document. Immedi immediately after the statement, after the uh, after the statement, I tried to make damage assessment by talking to archaeologists and historians in the region. Uh, the information I, get, I gathered was all the same, the statement uh, in the statement of this of the ministry. Then I wanted to find out what kind of strategy the Minister of Culture followed after the earthquake. Uh, the ministry uh, immediately set up a crisis desk after the earthquake. Troops uh, were sent to, uh, to the protect the museum, especially the Hatay Museum, uh, Hatay Archaeological Museum. The whole process was carried out within the framework of an emergency action plan for the protection, protection of museums in the aftermath of war and natural disasters set out by the United States and the U European Commission after the Second World War. This ready-made emergency action plan was initially well implemented in the region, especially in Hatay. In addition, uh, a damage assessment committee, think of six male archaeologists working in the region, was established by the ministry. The general directorate of foundations, Vakuflar Genel Müdürlüğün, and ICOMOS together formed a damage assessment committee for the destroyed mosques, ponds, churches, castles, and other historical buildings uh, in, in the region. However, Later on, after evolution of the crisis task and the abandonment of the action plan, the disaster area excavation directorship for Antakya in Turkish Afet Bölgesi Kazıbaşkanlığı was established. But the purpose of this directorship is unknown. This directorship does not include architects archaeologists and art historians working in the region. Uh, according to sharing documents, for the archaeological excavation to be carried out in the city, only four art historians working on Turkish Islamic art in the different uh, regions. And they are uh, the archaeological team of Ani Kars in Eastern Anatolia. And they, um, they, they didn't have any uh, uh, they, 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 they don't uh, specialize the region and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the art, art historical, architectural and archaeological studies in the region. On the other hand, Antakya is not a, uh, not a city that existed only during the Islamic period. If you, if you excavate and if you, uh, if you excavate this, uh, this city, you will find uh, the Roman uh, material and this is very important Roman city and uh, uh, this uh, uh, Antioch Antakya was uh, an important Christian center also so this is um, this city was not only the Islamic uh, Islamic uh, settlement uh, on the other hand um, uh, when we look at this um, directorship um, we haven't seen any archaeologists, art historians, historians, and architects who have been working in the center of Antakya and within the provincial borders uh, for many years. Uh, uh, for many years, these academics are not included in this ship, and we still don't know what this directorship of Etbulgis Kazıbaşkanı will do in Antakya, and this is a big question mark for us. 
Uh, another uh, issue in the earthquake zone related with the Minister of Culture is libraries. In Antakya, four public libraries were completely destroyed. In Malatya, Polat uh, public library suffered uh, heavy damage. In Kahramanj and Gaziantep, the public libraries were badly damaged. In Adiyaman, the serious damage in public libraries were not reported. An important issue for us, Ottoman historians, is manuscript libraries in the earthquake zone. There are two important manuscript libraries in this region. One library is Adana Public Library, having 2,592 manuscript books. And another is the Agyokalt Manuscript Library in Diyarbakir. No damage was reported for both libraries. Research Center for Marash History, uh, founded by Dulkadir Municipality in Kahraman Marash, has manuscript book collection uh, also. Uh, this research center was heavily uh, damaged. Uh, uh, damage. I could not receive any information about the collection being protected in this research center. Another important, uh, another important uh, collection for Ottoman and Sajukit studies uh, in the region is the Mukrimin Halil Hinaj collection in Kahraman Maraj Suci Imam University. This book, uh, the books, manuscripts, and archive of this respected historian are included in this collection. Uh, no damage was reported for this collection building also. In conclusion, in the centennial of the Republic, our country experienced a great uh, tragedy with earthquakes. I hope I was able to present to you a picture about some cultural heritage issue, issue in the region. And uh, thanks for listening. Thank you, Fahri. Thank you so much. Um, we were going to have Eylem Delikanlı with us to represent Research Institute on Turkey, but she had a family emergency. So I'm really grateful that uh, Ushin Önol uh, were, was able to join us uh, today to talk about what the Research Institute on Turkey has been doing. Uh, they started their fundraising campaign right on the day and actually raised quite a bit of funds to help Ahbab, as far as I know. Uh, Ushin, are you ready? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Baki, and many thanks for um, sparing uh, some time for us too in this very meaningful uh, mean, uh, meeting. And it goes without saying that we are enormously dev devastated by the destruction and the death toll uh, caused not only by the earthquake, but also the lack of meaningful urbanization and humanitarian aid by the government. And also our deepest condolences to all the lives uh, that are lost and we wish all the strength to the families and to the ones that are left behind, and particularly here to um, Yusuf Bey Bosch and Sausen Tekrar. Um, so it is hard to be away and feel um, helpless. Uh, it is hard to be away and feel helpless in times of uh, witnessing crisis like this, of course. And with this in mind, uh, a solidarity group of professionals and particularly academics and artists, activists from Turkey living in New York City, we immediately came together to raise funds and collect uh, first, of course, the essential items for the earthquake, um, victims in Turkey, but we are only, of course, one of the organizations who started raising funds in North America to provide financial aid to the uh, NGOs to deliver support uh, to the victims of the disasters in, disaster in Turkey. But let me briefly introduce uh, our in, uh, organization. Uh, research Institute uh, on Turkey is a grassroots research cooperative founded and based in New York City. Perhaps I can also just share the, uh, the website um, with you. Um, <clears throat> I think you see my screen, right? Mm -hmm. One second, please. And um, so it's a grassroots research cooperative founded and based in New York City. 
and we are an inter, um, international and interdisciplinary group of, I mean, not international, but not only living in New York City, but primarily based here. And we are an interdisciplinary group of researchers, artists, scientists, and activists who initially came together in solidarity with the Gezi movement, uh, with the resistance mo movement, remained, and then we remained in close contact afterwards and continued to explore and engage in a communication practices for social change in Turkey. Uh, our organization and solidarity practices are deeply rooted and inspired by our exper uh, experience with the Gezi resistance movement. This is important actually for us. And we aim to contribute uh, to a pluralistic, egalitarian and democratic Turkey with an emphasis on human rights, social and economic justice, gender equalities, sexual rights, cultural and political recognition and ecologic sustainability from a critical historical perspective. And as a registered nonprofit organization in New York State, we immediately brought our solidarity efforts to provide impactful funding for the area and the people, um, both damaged and devastated by the earthquake. Um, we work in solidarity and uh, close contact with a larger group of people in New York City also primarily came together during the Gezi moment as well as multiple grassroots organizations and NGOs in Turkey, um, also with the individuals working remotely and in the areas affected by the earthquake, as well as in the new zones of temp temporary placements. Um, so initially we wanted to, uh, we aimed at supporting APA, but now we are actually um, having a lot of meetings and considering to also support smaller NGOs that are more um, very specifically working with uh, the social groups uh, affected by the earthquake. Um, so perhaps this is the largest disaster we had to witness so far. And we very much hope, of course, it would be the last one. Uh, but we know that after such events, the attention span is not so long and our attentions will be pulled into another direction as soon as another significant incident occurs on the earth. However, a sustainable research, uh, support will be re uh, in, um, really necessary in the area. That's why we would like to support the most sustainable efforts in, that are working in the region. Uh, of course, we should remember also, it was mentioned by other speakers here, uh, that um, the area affected in southeast Turkey and northern Syria is a broken home where Armenian, Assyrian, Alevite, Kurdish, Yazidi people also coexist among the Turks and Syrians, and that also hosts refugees from Syria and Iraq uh, in south uh, east Turkey. Now these cities, of course, have been reduced to debris, and these groups are left alone, uh, yet again, and even more disadvantaged, like they were already disadvantaged groups, and after the earthquake, they are even more disadvantaged um, after this catastrophe. Um, that's why it is going to be a long-term project to rebuild these towns and in lives, uh, but we first would like to meet the most urgent needs, and uh, we will try our best giving these particular groups a priority uh, in providing the funds. That's why we are collaborating with a lot of individuals, a lot of uh, NGOs um, working uh, in the place. And we, of course, uh, have our families, friends in the region as well. That's why um, we are in very close contact, uh, meeting very um, uh, frequently, uh, both with uh, the friends in New York City, but also friends in Turkey, in region, who are both affected by the catastrophe, but also the ones who are um, providing support. So this is a very brief um, uh, introduction, and this is the website uh, RIT riturkey.org, uh, and this is the fundraising page. And there is also, uh, you can also find it on GoFundMe. And so far we uh, already raised uh, around 200,000. Actually, there is uh, slightly more than what is shown here. Um, and uh, we are also starting uh, smaller campaigns uh, that are more targeted. Uh, we would like to, uh, if we can, we are a very small group. And uh, as I said, individuals that came together after the Gezi movement 
and our um, the way we organize ourselves is very much informed uh, and inspired by Gezi, as I said earlier. So um, we would like to continue our efforts uh, on more targeted campaigns in terms of uh, rebuilding, perhaps in the future, if we can do uh, rebuilding uh, hospitals, schools, etc. But we don't know how how much we can. We will be able to also put our efforts, but for the moment. We have been able to raise these funds and we are hoping uh, to raise more and we will be running some um, social media campaigns as well in solidarity of uh, with artists and activists uh, that we started already and we will be um, releasing those ones soon as well. So um, we are now uh, working with many different little organizations, NGOs, as I said, to, to support more targeted um, uh, support instead of just leaving everything to uh, to the largest uh, organizations like Ahbab, for example. Uh, we also saw in time how much they also um, they gathered a lot of help, and they are also struggling with the difficulties. Of course, uh, that's why we we are more focusing on these smaller NGOs currently. I think this is all I would like to share for the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ishan, and thank you for uh, the exemplary work. Uh, for the audience, I should tell that um, OTSA does not have a 501c3 status. That's why we are not raising funds. Uh, 501c3 status uh, allows people who donate to make tax deductions. OTSA doesn't have that status. It's something that we realize and we are working on uh, for one reason or another. It had not been done before. Hopefully, we'll uh, be, you know, able to manage that by the end of this year. But thank you. Thank you so much to Research Institute on Turkey for this great, great uh, leadership on fundraising. Jihan, please, it's, it's your turn. Thank you very much, Baki, for the invitation. I'm going to share my screen. Um, uh, but before that, I wanted to say, Bashan uh, sağ Yusuf, yani gerçekten uh, it's it's painful. Uh, it's it was difficult to listen to all of that, and uh, we share your pain to the extent possible. But uh, you know, uh, it's yeah. I mean, words are not enough. I I don't know what to say. This is really painful. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the the global making uh, of this uh, calamity, and I, I want to emphasize it particularly especially because you know the, this disaster is uh, discussed as a, a very much national or regional one it's because of you know the, the region or its national makeup this is all happening well I, I think there are ma many national and regional determinants but there are global determinants as well and they are mostly ignored especially in the main mainstream press and mainstream academy so I would like to draw attention to those. Um, so the the I mean the the basic question is really why uh, why are these constructions so poor? Why are these buildings so poorly constructed? And why are they uh, built always on the wrong places? And uh, to understand that, we have to look at Turkish political economy. Uh, so the, the Turkish economic miracle, as it was called in the 2000, uh, 2000s and early 2010s, was built on a construction-driven bubble, uh, which was dependent on global uh, flow of cash. I won't go into that, but what interests me more is the household debt, uh, a ballooning debt uh, throughout Turkey, and low wages and, secure, and insecure jobs that pushed people into these uh, unsafe buildings. And we have to understand that this was, of course, a national choice, but it was a suggested slash imposed by international institutions, uh, by the uh, so-called post-Washington consensus. So keep wages low, keep jobs insecure, but uh, encourage people to go into debt, credit card debt, mortgages, uh, that they can't really afford uh, so they will remain in that uh, uh, throughout their lives and uh, push them into these buildings uh, so th th there is choice but at the same time there is no choice 
And uh, of course, I I'm not saying this was only because of uh, these uh, financial global institutions. The, the AKP very willingly embraced this and also gave it its own twist because uh, beyond the imagination of uh, the IMF and World Bank, uh, the state uh, started to organize and produce uh, or at least take part in the production of all of these unsafe houses and other infrastructure, in, including a really horrible uh, roads and uh, 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 airports, as we have seen in this earthquake. And uh, this was uh, mostly done to enrich uh, five top uh, AKP connected uh, contractors, but also tens of thousands of uh, medium scale contractors contact, uh, connected to the AKP. Uh, so that there, as I'm saying, you know, there's a lot of element of choice in this so people participated in this willingly not just the AKP but other parties as well and their followers you know people either either participated in the building uh, of these constructions or living in them so there is choice but let's not forget the force element which I will expand on a little later uh, but you, you can see how all of this miracle was driven by construction and uh, we should not, again, forget the responsibility of the West in all, all of this, not just these global financial institutions, the mainstream press, the mainstream academy, experts, they were all applauding Turkey as all of this was happening. I mean, look, look, look at this uh, graphics uh, from starting from 2002, 2003, construction becomes the driving engine of this very much celebrated economy. Turkey is the red line. Uh, the, the share of construction in Turkey, in Turkish growth, is just uncomparable to all similar uh, countries and also to OECD countries. Uh, this is how uh, the, the share of construction in uh, overall GDP was growing uh, during this time frame and again because of reasons i can't go into here it started to decline after 2007 2018 but it was already too late i mean all of these horrible buildings were built already by then and uh the the people themselves as i have been pointing out were dependent on these or made dependent on these houses but also the the uh, the jobs that created these houses so as uh, agricultural and industrial employment throughout Turkey was destroyed by World Bank policies. More and more people went into insecure construction jobs. So by bo both uh, through residents and through employment, people became enmeshed with this ecologically unsustainable uh, system. So, but what about the houses built before the AKP? And I'm emphasizing this because still, I mean, we, we don't know, and maybe we will never know because there won't be independent in investigations. We don't know how many of these destroyed buildings that killed so many people, how many of them were built under the AKP, how many of them were built in the 1980s and 1990s. So uh, we, we should, but, but we know that many, you know that there are there is blame on both sides uh, of this historical divide pre AKP post AKP uh, the buildings built before the AKP also killed a lot of people and uh, so but Bülent Batuman went into this uh, so I, again I won't talk about the national determinants but that's also very important background uh, so in, in the 1960s 1970s the poorly constructed buildings were mostly one story buildings, sometimes two story buildings. They wouldn't kill as many people. So uh, the, the 1980s, 1990s squatter buildings were four to five story buildings and, and they have killed many people. And again, I, sh I should underline that this is not a Turkish issue. The World Bank was encouraging shoddy buildings throughout the world. Uh, for poor people under the name of, you know, the, the fancy name of self, self help housing. And these uh, came to Turkey uh, through the Jenny, January 24 decisions uh, uh, of, uh, of a World Bank economist called Turgut Özal, who then became prime minister and president in the 1980s, early 1990s. But his policy package could not have been uh, applied 
given the structure of Turkey in, in the 1970s or, or like early 1980, because there were militant workers unions and they would not have permitted low wages. So these unions had to be removed. And here, another part of the global making of this disaster is coming into the picture. The, the generals, uh, the, uh, the junta, uh, that removed uh, the militant unions, crushed them, you know, exiled their leaders, killed their leaders, uh, hanged uh, the people in uh, uh, working in corporations, uh, cooperation with these uh, militant unions. Uh, these these generals, they were all gladio trained. Okay, we have to understand this very clearly. These, these were special operations generals trained by the U.S. and its allies. Okay, and without them, this model, this World Bank model, could have never been applied in Turkey. So, uh, very shortly, one last slide. So that that's how the you know the the entire disaster is created. But what about disaster relief? So I won't uh, cover the first item on this slide. Uh, neoliberalism as co uh, cost cutting. It's very obvious. I mean, this this applies to F FEMA as well, not just to Afad. Uh, Throughout the world, less and less funds are given to disaster relief because the neoliberal state has to cut, uh, cut costs. It, it, it's that that's as clear as day. But the 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 more Turkish question, or apparently Turkish question here, is wh why wouldn't the uh, second largest military of NATO help people? Why would it be hands off in the middle of a disaster? Uh, th th there are th things to do with the secular Islamic balances in Turkey. I won't go into these, but I, I will give you the the response of the Ministry of Defense Minister of Defense to this question. You know, people are asking in the earthquake zone, where are the soldiers? And the Minister of Defense says, "Well, what do you mean? Should we have emptied Iraq and Syria of our forces?" Should we have helped you instead? That, that's insane. We, Of course we can't do that. So who is the person who says this? The Minister of Defense, Hulusi Akar. He is a former soldier uh, top, uh, at the top. He used to be at the top of the Turkish military. He is trained by the US as well. He is a counter guerrilla officer as well. And what, what his statement implies is that the real function of the Turkish military is not helping people. It's not the safety of the people. It's not the security of the people. It is repressing the Kurdish insurgency in Iraq and Syria. And uh, th that again is something enabled by, enabled and empowered, encouraged by global forces, as well as by national uh, causes, uh, as I have been saying. And that's all I will say today. Rihan, um, thank you so much. You really summed it up so precisely and so succinctly. Uh, thank you. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, we are lucky enough to have uh, our guest speaker uh, now among us. I think I think his meeting ended. Uh, I hope uh, Garobe can hear us right now. I am very happy uh, to have invited him because of his uh, principal stance against uh, Imar Afli in Turkey in 2018. Um, Garobe, can you hear me? Can you take? Uh, can you uh, turn on your uh, camera yes, and join I us? I can hear Are you. you. Okay, please go ahead. Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry about being late. I, I had another meeting and several meetings today. Unfortunately, I couldn't listen uh, what you have just spoken. Um, I have been in the earthquake area for 24 days and uh, just returned from the earthquake zone. I, I saw so many crimes. This is not a catastrophe. No, uh, we, unfortunately, we saw so many crimes and those crimes were coming. We shouted that that, that uh, big catastrophe is coming and nobody did anything about it. So maybe this is a crime. This is a this is maybe the biggest massacre of uh, this century. Uh, because all the scientists were shouting about this, uh, you know, earthquake was coming and the government did not prepare uh, those earthquake regions for the earthquake. And we in the parliament offered se several bills to just uh, have some budget to prepare our cities, uh, but they just refused it because the government's choice was repressing the people. They just, uh, they just had more 
military person and police officers, which only tried to suppress the opposition and also uh, especially the Kurds. And I, I believe uh, what I saw in the earthquake re region, um, people's trust is uh, under the rubble because everyone wants to trust the system, first of all, and they saw that uh, they saw that their houses were not strong enough to resist the earthquake, first of all, their loved ones were under the rubble, and the system did not come to help them uh, after, uh, no, in the first 72 hours, which were so decisive for their loved ones to live or die. And unfortunately, nobody came to help them because everybody was waiting orders from one man. If you only wait orders from one man, uh, no, it takes time to you to act. That is why so many people died. And second of all, I can say neo neoliberalism just killed people because you know uh, we didn't have electric electricity. No, because the electricity system was you no know, uh, private private privatized and the. Firms only cared about their interests and they didn't invest enough to the infrastructure of electricity. Second of all, we didn't have internet because the private sectors uh, just uh, didn't uh, invest enough. Uh, uh, and uh, the, uh, the stations that they had uh, were on the roofs of the you know, uh, not strong build buildings and which were demolished. That is why we didn't have internet, and people just sent uh, messages from from the rubble to the, their loved ones from WhatsApp, let's say, and those messages came a week later, uh, and we took them from the rubble and we buried them. Then we had those messages that we are I'm un under the rubble. Please come and save me. And those messages uh, reached to their lo loved ones after they were buried, unfortunately. And uh, and of course they didn't have tents and anything, any any kind of humanitarian aids. I'm I'm sure you have spoken about it. Uh, I'm sorry if I am just repeating everything. But you no, know, people's trust is under the rubble, and uh, they saw that the centralized system killed them, and neoliberal uh, system uh, made them vulnerable. Uh, so they are very, uh, they are very angry. People are very angry. But the, uh, the media is controlled by mostly by Erdogan, and they only saw uh, sh show, showed them some kind of miracles after the third day. But you no, know, they didn't show people that ten thousands of people were dying or dead. Uh, so they are still uh, trying to show people that uh, they can construct new buildings. They 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 have thousands of especially big contractors. And uh, they they he wants to show that still he can he's strong and he can build uh, new uh, buildings for them. He is just uh, trying to give them some hope. But you no, know, um, uh, he, he. But people are very angry, and and I'm sure it's going to be decisive uh, for the uh, May uh, elections. Um, and in the parliament, we offered so many bills, but Erdogan just declared emergency law, and he's just saying that. Uh, he he he's going to he's deciding what he, kind of aid should be given to 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 the victims, but we we are offering bills in the parliament which can help people uh, what they need, but uh, he doesn't accept and he just declared emergency law. He is just giving let's say three thousand liras to uh, to the people which is about $150 a month. And, uh, and people have millions of people moved from, from the earthquake zones to the other cities, but at, the rents are at least for you know, $600, something like that. Uh, so um, the A's are not enough. No, the, uh, and uh, other, uh, no, and uh, millions are, of people needs help, but you no know, Erdogan just 
took over all the aids that we were trying to provide to the people. And that is why you now people cut, uh, people st uh, stopped to send aids because you now he wants to show that uh, he is only sending the aid to the people. And, and that is why you know, uh, the humanitarian aids have, have st stopped and there were so many uh, no, corrupt corruptions about the aid system, which is the Afad and Kazalai. And so people do not have any kind of a trust to those system. So uh, I don't I don't see so many. Yeah, the, the aid should be bigger and greater. But uh, first, the rescue teams have uh, came to Turkey. But we need a sustainable humanitarian aid, which is not coming because uh, in Turkey, especially the civil civil society activists do not have any kind of a, a trust to Erdogan's system. And from the world, that is what I see. The aids are not sustainable, but people need those kind of aids. But we cannot convince him to cooperate with the opposition or and the, or the civil society. I, I think uh, in these two months he will only sh try to show his power to the people and stop every kind of aid uh, which which are not in in his name. Um, if I don't know if this, if this is enough, no. Thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, if you have further questions, I'm ready. Thank you, um, Garo Bey. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate you making a, a time. I already wrote this on the chat. Please, uh, if anybody has any questions, you can either use the raise hand function, which you can find in the Zoom control under the screen. If uh, under reactions uh, and raise your hand, ask, and then uh, you would take the floor to ask your question live, or you could put your question on chat. I already see one question on chat that I'm going to uh, ask in one second. But first, I want to ask Garobe about uh, reports that I read uh, suggesting some HDP organized help was stopped on the road and uh, returned. Uh, what, what happened to that aid? Did it, did it eventually find its destination or was it taken uh, to a central location given somewhere else? Because this came up in the, uh, the earlier presentation about Samanda, help sent to Samanda was also sent away and not taken there. Uh, is there a way of following up on this and finding out what happened? You know, this is maybe one thing you have heard, but for 25 days, we have been struggling to just save the aids that our locals sent to the earthquake zone. Our most biggest effort, unfortunately, we just spent to that, to save those aid trucks or aid organizations, uh, aid materials to save them from Erdogan's you know, uh, security guards, because you know he is he's just taking over our hundreds of trucks and uh, just put a flag in front of it, showing that it is just provided by AKP. Uh, but you no, know, that is why, as I told you, uh, the aid uh, that, that our locals are providing have stopped, and still he is trying to do it. And mo uh, moreover. We had several initiatives, but he just appointed a trustee to, to those organizations and uh, stopped all those you know, initiate, initiatives, which were we were pro pro providing so many humanitarian aid to do, especially to, to the countryside. You no, know? now that is very important. That is very significant because uh, we we need to keep the people uh, uh, continue to live in their locals, especially in the countryside, uh, because go cities have uh, turned to, to a ghost cities, especially the city centers, Adiyaman, Hatay, and uh, Maraş city centers are ghost cities nowadays. But in the uh, countryside, people are trying to live there because they only thing they have is their land uh, or they are you no know, uh, and, and so uh, uh, they are doing agriculture uh, and so they need, they want to stay there that is why we try to help them um, uh, mostly but they have stopped all those initiatives unfortunately 
Thank you. Thank you so much. In case you have to leave early, I'm going to ask you one more question, and then I'm going to get to the questions on the chat. You said you had your uh, parliament meeting, parliamentary group meeting today. Uh, what are the first r responses to the big news of today that the uh, Altılı Masa is now uh, looking like it's becoming the Beşli Masa? Or uh, what is, uh, it, it, given this, uh, how do you think uh, will this play out in the upcoming elections? You know, uh, this earthquake really hurt, uh, you know, Erdogan's approval rates. And uh, 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 because Erdogan thought he, he could win this election again, we, uh, but uh, he, his approval rates are terrible after this earthquake. And I believe in the state, deep state or whatever you call it, there was an equation, there was, Akshener might have spoke with them and they convinced them to, Akshener to just leave that table. But I'm, I don't think, you know, with Akshener, uh, the ones who vote for Akshener will leave that table because they are also unhappy with one man uh, ruled country, one man, one man, one man ruled uh, city, uh, system. So, uh, uh, no, uh, and maybe this is something good for us as well. Why? Because uh, we always we always believe that to change the mechanism is not enough. We need to change the system. Uh, Erdogan is a nationalist and he has a nationalist partner. Uh, but if uh, the ones who are uh, from Diyarbakir, which is my you know, city, where I was elected, they are asking what is going to change if we get rid of Erdogan and uh, Akshener gets the power. I I didn't have any kind of a question because she was uh, she 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 is also a nationalist and she she is she had uh, repressed uh, the Kurds in the 1990s and uh, she she doesn't want to give any kind of a right to the Kurds so. Maybe this is, uh, we might see this as a bad thing, but we will see, you know, this, this might not be a bad thing. Maybe this might uh, even give us more power uh, to the op opposition camp. I still have, vo uh, I, I still have big hope to win the elections. Thank you. Thank you so much, Garobe. Uh, I'm going to now go to the questions on the chat. Uh, first come, first serve. The first question was by Onur Arslan, and he asked it to all the panelists. Uh, I have a question for those who visited the earthquake area or who got direct information from the survivors. Many people still could not find their relatives and friends. Why are there so many lost people? I guess this was an issue in 1999 as well. Does Anyone have any idea about uh, why there are so many lost people? I, I have an idea. Please. You know, because we didn't have professional rescue teams in the first three days, three or five days. And people just found the ex excavators and just uh, worked on the rubble and just uh, uh, trying to take rid of, uh, try, trying to get to their loved ones. Unfortunately, uh, with those excavators, they just uh, know those bodies were uh, taken into pieces. And that is why we have so many uh, lost ones. Because they tried to do it by them, their, themselves without professional teams. So that is why they took all those bodies with the excavators and poured them to the to other places. I, I, that I saw it and I tried to stop them. After 48 hours, people thought everybody died under the rubble, but I I tried to convince them, but I, I couldn't reach everywhere in Adiaman and other places, it was the same. So maybe that is why we have so many lost ones. I actually heard accounts uh, that would confirm it. I, I heard that uh, international rescue teams, some of them decided to leave because once they realized the government was using heavy machinery, they thought uh, this is not something that they- Not only the government, pe people were using it because they, weren't, they knew nothing about rescuing people. 
no, they only wanted to get, get to the body of their loved ones. They thought they, they died and they, they, they did it by them, themselves because they were, there was no public officers there. I, fact, I think you wanted to respond to, please. Yeah, I just, just wanted to add that uh, we, we have to remember that the earthquake uh, unleashed uh, the largest internal migration of the Republican period. Thousands and thousands of people have moved uh, uh, to, to other places, to other cities. And this was due to uh, safety and security concerns and lack of aid and so on. So I think that is another reason why there are so many people who are lost because families are now, uh, they lost touch uh, with the rest of their relatives and so on. So. Uh, and, and as Yusuf said, after a certain point, people basically gave up uh, hope or lost hope that they could ever uh, reach their uh, relatives and family members and just, you know, yeah, uh, and, and, and moved on. So I, I think that's another reason. And I don't think that the level of loss uh, was at the same level uh, in the during the 1999 earthquake earthquake by any means. But if somebody else knows better than... I stand corrected. Thank you. Thank you, Eifert. Uh, the next question is from Julian uh, Sayarar, and um, uh, she said, maybe for Bülent and Jihan, we know the problems of construction-led growth and of the TOKI model of development. Uh, TOKI, for those of you who don't know, is the um, government agency that builds uh, big uh, developments in different cities in Turkey. But doesn't the ap apparent good performance of Toki buildings in the earthquake complicate this view? And I guess here uh, Julian is referring to the fact that Toki buildings apparently survived the earthquake uh, uh, in a much better way than uh, all other buildings. Uh, Bülent, Jihan, would you like to say anything on this? Would you like to go ahead, Jihan? Uh, Bülent, go first, please. If you have things to say, then I'll, I'll chime sure, in. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, well, um, I I was uh, in the area. I spent a week. And uh, of course, one of the things we had in mind was the performance of the Tokyo uh, settlements. Now, the thing is, Tokyo is mass housing administration. And I mean, it's too complicated to discuss in details, but it's true. I mean, Tokyo houses, Tokyo blocks, residential blocks uh, performed uh, relatively well. Uh, but that's because uh, this actually shows us, I mean, it complicates indeed, it complicates the situation, but not in the sense that, oh, should we realize that uh, RKP has done something well? It's not about that. It's about the uh, the complexity of building production and its relationship to urbanization. What am I trying to say is, uh, on the one hand, you have the problems about the quality of uh, construction itself. So there are problems with that. In, uh, and of course, there is the problem with urban planning and creating land rent. Now, the, the Toki uh, blocks, which performed well, actually shows us that uh, they did good because they were uh, located in these remote areas where the, the ground, the geological conditions are good, right? Because they, it wasn't about rent. It was about relocating people. Uh, in cases where it's about gentrification, this is how uh, the poor people are being dislocated. So they are sent to the fringes, right? So this is working where you have uh, low building heights for five story at most. And you are using tunnel formwork, tunnel color, right? Which minimizes technical problems. And uh, the location is sound in terms of uh, seismic activity. Now, this shows us that this is doable, right? But at the same time, it shows us that uh, if you do it like this, you are ignoring the social and economic relations in terms of rent and relocation, et cetera, et cetera. So paradoxically, uh, it shows us that in terms of building production, this is doable in any place, not in Istanbul, in Ankara only, but even in Adıyaman and whatnot. But at the same time, when also we look at the buildings, public buildings built by Turkey, 
they didn't perform as well. That's also something we need to pay attention. I mean, as, again, something we should also mention is uh, Toki is immune from uh, the in inspection system that, that I have mentioned in the beginning, right? So when you use uh, tunnel formwork, when you limit building heights, and when you pay attention to the ground conditions, uh, it's, it's always possible to build buildings which are uh, resilient uh, to, uh, to earthquakes. Thank you, uh, Bülent. Uh, Jihan, will you add anything? Yes, uh, so it is true, as the question says, this complicates the picture. And uh, I, I agree with everything uh, Bülent said, uh, but again, you know, I, I'm going to scale up and look at it from uh, the World Bank, World Bank perspective. Uh, we need to understand that the World Bank didn't sanction this part of the equation. <laughs> so ironically, uh, the thing that the World Bank didn't sanction worked well <laughs> so i mean that, that that's a huge part of the irony so it, it is it is right as as i fair karaka just put in the chat that toki was not established by the akp but it uh, gained this productive extremely productive role only with uh, the akp uh, but just just one last note though so when we talk about state capitalism under the akp it's not just toki and it's not just uh, production by the state state capitalism especially under this broader world bank paradigm when you know state capitalism gets inserted into into neoliberalism it's mostly used for organizing private contractors and making them go wild you know un under a like purely market market which never exists the contractors could never go this wild so the akp has used the state to organize these medium uh, scale and large contractors and made them ri richer more uh, more than the market could so that's really at the root uh, of the broader destruction and toki is like a small part of this picture thank you thank you jihan um a question from jansu shahin um uh, sorry if I skip the part that mentioning decree number 126. Not a question, but maybe you can explain the possible consequences of it. I think Bülent Ocam or Sevgili uh, Vekilimiz Garobe could comment on 126. So this is decree number 126. I imagine this means something very clear. Uh, Bülent Bey, would you like to go first? Sure. Let me let me briefly explain. This is the presidential decree, uh, which uh, actually. Well, it's a state of emergency uh, in the area politically, but there is all, this is a state of emergency, declaring a state of emergency in terms of urban planning. So what it says is we are not going to follow any rules and regulations that guides and slows down planning and implementation. We are not going to even uh, care about the rights of the people to uh, object to the planning processes to uh, defend their property rights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's uh, declaring state of emergency to execute construction at once. This is highly problematic, I and mean, because well, there are rules and regulations. And planning, I mean, actually, in very brief terms, planning is something that has to be done slowly, taking time, you know, relying on science, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is not about planning, but trying to start construction without planning because he's in a hurry, because he wants to show that he can construct, he can build. Of course, there is this ironic thing. I mean, normally when there is an earthquake, you cannot build concrete structures for some time because of the tremors, right? Because if you are pouring concrete and if you have tremors, then it wouldn't work. It wouldn't fix so i mean for some time it's normally banned construction is banned for months so i don't i don't really understand how right now they are starting to uh, you know uh, start construction in certain areas but anyway so the decree is about that and yes it is a statement of uh, as uh, garo pailan has already said it's about showing power i can do this right so he wants to uh, give the message to the people that uh, he can, he will reconstruct everything. He will reconstruct cities from scratch. So that's, that's Erdogan's game plan. 
Uh, çok teşekkür ederim. Garo Bey, would you like to add something? No, Bülent summarized very well. I don't have anything to add because he only wants to show the power. But we have living hundreds of aftershocks. You can't do it. You can't do it. And he is just giving permission, uh, just uh, uh, planning uh, to, con to uh, construct buildings in the forest areas. Let, let's say it is forbidden, but he is just doing it. So um, with, with the emergency law, uh, he he is trying to do everything. Uh, you no. Know, um to but he's just ignoring the regulations and doing everything to show his power that's it uh, to just uh, have the votes of the voters because he's just planning to do one million uh, houses apartments let's say but he just he's just going to say if you don't give me the votes you forget about the building that's it no, he, that is what he are, he's trying to do yeah, I, I also remember reading um, uh, earthquake experts, seismologists, uh, specifically uh, the, advising the government that the buildings should not start soon. So I, I'll just add that to the uh, already said things. I'm, and we're going to move to the next question. Elif Balin uh, wrote, I would appreciate any thoughts about the impact of the earthquakes and government response on the universities and university students and what solidarity can be meaningful from us to the academy and related organizations to recover the education system as we see the destroyed education system and educated professionals leaving turkey must be related to the structural technical and political causes discussed in this panel uh then she added i understand if this panel expertise is not relevant enough for my question but i think i i could very briefly say the list of charities that we listed on our web page does include boyut uh, Boğaziçi University's alumni living abroad, uh, raising money to help university students displaced by the earthquake. It also includes a similar effort by Middle East Technical University uh, the alumni who are collecting money to help specifically to university students. And then I can also add that uh, the government's decree, which we didn't get a chance to even touch upon, to carry the educational system to remote instruction in order to empty uh, spots in uh, dormitories so that uh, people who were displaced by the earthquake could be um, you know, uh, housed. That decree has been uh, criticized by many in Turkey and also recently Middle East Studies Association of North America's Committee on Academic Freedom issued a letter uh, criticizing the uh, that decree and asking questions about how there are so many houses that could be used uh, elsewhere uh, that in order to house these uh, people. So uh, why are we not thinking of other responses? So these are my very short answers pointed, but if anybody from the panel would like to say a few things about uh, the higher education system, I mean, I, I guess we could talk for hours about the higher education system. If you look at Mesa Kaf's letters on Turkey, there are so many of them that list so many problems. Uh, but uh, since we are talking about the earthquake, if anybody would like to say something about students and the earthquake, please go ahead. Metin Bey, uh, buyurun. Yeah, I, we have been teaching actually online uh, so far. And most of the students have been unhappy about it. Uh, I mean, it's been almost uh, since the spring of 2020. And only last year, we were able to teach face-to-face. -face. So this has been a big hit to the students too. Um, I don't know how many uh, so far in Turkey. We have probably at least 2 million. I don't know the number exactly. Uh, but the thing is that... Um, Many universities have been trying to provide, uh, depends on their capacity, uh, different ways of helping the victims from collecting uh, donations to uh, helping the family of the students. Uh, for example, uh, we have students who lost almost all their family members. So we have been trying to give uh, such students not only um, financial aid, but also uh, psychological help as well, especially psychology departments definitely have lots of uh, things. I mean, um, 
they, they, they need to get more into the field, uh, most likely. And many of them have been doing that, including Middle East Technical University and my own university too. Um, I was talking to some of my students, for example, they were telling me that they have a theater group and they try to cheer up kids. Uh, they visit the uh, uh, children who uh, now are without families, uh, uh, coming from the uh, earthquake areas, or even uh, the families themselves. I mean, uh, if they uh, really would like to watch something and they, they are trying to come up with any way of helping students and professors. So that's one thing. But on the other hand, uh, I would expect from the uh, Western institutions in the US and Europe actually to give support to professors and students of the uh, affected regions. Um, now, many of my colleagues there, uh, either they are not able to teach this year or they, um, because their families are affected, some of them passed away, some of them don't have housing, uh, some of them still don't have internet too. Uh, those people will need lots of support in the future, not in, only for one year or two years, but probably at least for another decade. Uh, I was talking to a group of uh, friends today, uh, which we have like an, uh, uh, a support group. Uh, the head of the group was telling me that in the first two weeks, we had lots of uh, aid uh, pouring in, but now people kind of uh, either got used to it or tired or don't have much to support too. Uh, at the end, in Turkey, we have a huge economical problem uh, as well. So it's not easy to... Uh, continuously support uh, of victims, at least financially. So uh, I definitely urge my colleagues in the West uh, to uh, be more sympathetic towards uh, all the victims. Uh, if they can do it only to towards the academics, that's fine too. Uh, as long as they are able to uh, sympathize with and understand the situation, it's a to huge disaster. I mean, without seeing it and uh, and feeling it, it's impossible to understand too. And it has been not only affected the region, but also the rest of the uh, Turkey too, because uh, these are more cosmopolitan regions uh, where you have relatives from all around. So people in Istanbul feel the same pain uh, people in Ankara or people in uh, Rize or Artvin or any other places, uh, anyone around Turkey, you will, uh, you talk to them, you will see that they have someone they know or a loved one or a relative in the region. So uh, almost all Turkey has been actually affected uh, psychologically too. Uh, so I hope we will have more support financially or spiritually or I don't know, whichever it could be done uh, from our colleagues uh, outside of the country, uh, any any form of uh, help is appreciated. Thank you. Metin Hocam, thank you. Uh, another question, uh, Gözde Mercan wrote, Ayfer Hoca or other speakers, if there is time left, could you please share your views on the situation with social media? Thank you. And then I'm going to add to this another question that came up uh, uh, Lynn from Lynn Chanel. Uh, she says, uh, I was wondering about if the panelists could comment on image control and the internet restrictions on Twitter and the shutting down of Ekşi um, Sözlük. So the, these two questions are related to each other. Uh, Ayfer's name was mentioned, so maybe Ayfer could start, and then I'm sure a few other people might want to say a few things too. Ayfer, would you like to go first? Yeah, I mean, the, the questions themselves, especially the second one, already includes the answer. This was all about image control and showing the state as powerful 
and uh, uh, and hence, you know, uh, the restrictions that were put on the social media because there was this sudden outburst of anger and you know all the all the cries for help that that were being shared on social media. It really uh, made the state look incompetent because it was incompetent. Uh, so uh, it was all about image control. Did the same uh, is true for. Uh, uh, what uh, Garobe was saying, you know, when when uh, civil societal organizations were sending aid trucks, for example, they would be stopped and then uh, uh, delayed uh, most of the time or or, or reoriented, uh, redirected to other places. But uh, in any case, they would only be let in uh, with uh, whatever flags or signs they had. Uh, if they were replaced with uh, the flags or signs of Afat or Kuzulai, some kind of state institution, uh, they would not let in anything that carried a sign or a flag of a civil societal organization, especially if this was a uh, like an Alevi organization or uh, HDP, you know, or uh, uh, Turkish Chipartisi or, or, or CHP. Uh, so this this is all about it was all about image control uh, and 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 trying to appear powerful even though the state miserably failed uh, in in really helping out its uh, its citizens um, and and also uh, just to add um, uh, you know like for example uh, they they viewed uh, all the successful civil societal efforts uh, uh to to uh, uh to uh bring aid uh, to people and coordinate uh aid at the local level uh with envy i mean they they view that as uh sort of uh rivaling uh the state's power diminishing the the the, the power of the state and in the end uh in they they ended up appointing uh a, a state official uh to take over uh, the aid uh, coordination at a Jemevi, for example, in uh, in Marash, uh, Pazarjuk, uh, even though everything that was going on there was completely private, they basically said, no, from now on, it's the state who is going to take control of all this aid. Um, <clears throat> just finally, by way of correction, it seems like the general impression about this region is such that uh, people feel that, um, and there are many minority groups, obviously, you know, uh, we already mentioned them, but in terms of the Alevi population, a uh, population living living in this part of uh, the country, people only know about Samanda, uh, but there are other sort of pockets of Alevi, uh, um, uh, Alevi strongholds, if you will, uh, that that were impacted very heavily, it, it, and and there are Alevi strongholds in places like Adiyaman, Marash, and Malatya, and so on. So it's not only uh, Samanda by, by by any means. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ifer. Would anybody else like to add anything to this? Um, Please Mr. go ahead. Baki, no, no. I, I, can I leave? By the way, I, I'm just asking if you, there are no further questions. Oh, actually, and, then let me ask you. If, since you have to go, there's one question that had you in it. Uh, some good news just arrived that 659-year-old St. George's uh, Greek Orthodox Church in Antakya finally got registered today as a historical asset after a backlash on social media against the demolition decision. Is there currently any research and studies being done by academics and politicians to create an inventory of any other historical assets that may not be registered as such? in order to mitigate any potential risk of certain motivations to erase non-Islamic history from the region at this unfortunate times. What else can be done to raise awareness uh, about this issue, asks Ilda Tanolo. Uh, Garobe, do you have any uh, uh, things to say on this question? Of course, uh, there's a fear about it, you know, uh, to just ra erase uh, the you know, uh, cultural her heritage of the, the, the uh, uh, minorities, let's say. But there are thousands of lonely churches in Anatolia, thousands. And this has a community, of course. Uh, so um, I, I think we are going to try to keep the people there. If the uh, churches are lonely 
uh, even if you renovate those churches, there, there's no point there. We need people around those ch uh, churches. So for that, we need to to keep people there. We need security. Uh, you know, people are afraid of the jihadist groups uh, there, and so many people are moving from Hatta, uh, from Hatay city and other cities. So we have less Christians in Hatay, and this destruction just made a fear fear factor and so they are leaving so even if we renovate the churches we might not have the people people are important and ch uh, churches with the people are more important i guess thank you thank you so much uh, there are a couple of more questions to you but i think they are more election related and i don't want to put you on the spot because uh these recent developments are kind of very hot and I don't know how you would respond to them and you have to go, you said. So please uh, uh, accept our thanks for making time in your very busy schedule to join us here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, uh, thank you for and, having me. Thank uh, you very much. Hopefully we can have you over at another uh, OTSA event uh, for more. Maybe maybe we'll have an event on the elections and then you can address of those course. questions more directly. It would be a pleasure election. for me. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, now, sorry, uh, I, are... I also have to leave actually to pick up my daughter. So, uh... oh sure, sure. Okay. I, both, I know we, we have gone way beyond our time limit. So uh, I know there are more questions, but people have to go. Um, so the, I I really really appreciate everybody's time. It's been more than two and a half hours. So maybe we should end right here. Uh, and the remaining questions will. Uh, I'm really sorry. It's just uh, it really for our panelists, it's a little bit too much to expect for them to stay two and a half hours and plus. So thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, making time to join us. I, I will be uploading the video recording on YouTube uh, later today. So you should be able to see it within the next 48 hours uh, at the latest. And if I couldn't get to your question, I'm really sorry. Uh, Caroline, actually, I did have a question for you. Uh, before we leave, uh, do you have anything to say about Ottomans ever thinking about earthquake uh, prevention? Did they ever, ever, ever occur to them? Did you come across to anything? Because it looks like the old buildings were built in such a way that they withstand this earthquake better than some of the newer construction. Well, there are documents about um, about Istanbul in the 18th century, you know, about brick versus wood and so on. And I think I can't remember the name of the younger, what's she called? There's a younger academic who's written on the more on the sort of social side of academic of um, earthquakes. Our work was not on that. We weren't particularly interested in the social impact of earthquakes, so I can't say a lot about it. I mean, our focus was to provide material for scientists, which is why the working together of a historian and a seismologist is so important in this work. So there is, but I think you'll have to look elsewhere than in what I've been doing. Maybe architectural stuff. Thank you again. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and I'm very sorry for those questions that we couldn't get to. And uh, many, there are many thank you messages coming in the chat from everybody who's, who was here. Thank you. Thank you so much.